Hi, friends. My name is Salim Hugh Penny. I am the 2021 Poetry Coalition Fellow at Zuglossia and a 2019 Cave Canem Fellow. I'm delighted to be sharing space with you today, and I'm so excited to have three poets share their work and have an intersectional discussion around disability poetics. I'll start off by doing a brief introduction. At, I'll, I'll start off by having each poet do a brief visual description and I'll read their bio. After that, each poet will read one poem and then we'll have a brief discussion, free flowing, natural, organic, and do a little wrap up that hopefully leaves you with even more things to talk about and more discussions to continue in your own circles. So I'm a black man. I'm wearing a black sweatshirt. I have a red, white, and blue West African pattern headscarf, handlebar mustache, and glasses. I'm wearing a right-sided cochlear implant, and behind me is a white wall and a corner of a, of a bed because it's the pandemic. I use the pronouns he, him, and friend, and I want to acknowledge that I'm zooming in from Chicago, which is the traditional and unceded territories of the three fire peoples, which is the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Badawanami. Thank you so much for sharing this space and this land together. I'll start off by introducing our first poet and letting her give a brief visual description, Khadija Queen. Hi, I am a brown-skinned Black woman with salt and pepper hair, very large and curly. I'm wearing all Black and in a room full of plants on Tutelo and Monacan land. Thank you so much. Uh, next, Raymond, if you could do a brief visual description and intro. Sure, my name is Raymond. I'm wearing a yellow shirt, a black, uh, a black top underneath, underneath that. Um, I have two hearing aids with a large white um, headphones to help amplify sound uh, for me to make this event accessible. Uh, I'm, sat, I'm sat in front of a bookshelf and I'm speaking from the heart of empire, which is uh, London. Thank you, and LMR. Uh, hi, um, I am a brownish red skin, uh, man, cisgender man. Uh, I have a thick eyebrow, black eyebrows, rounded brown eyes. I have this ratty beard uh, with the soul patch and shoulder length interlocked black, brown and maroon hair. Um, I look like people from where I'm from in Florida <laughs> um, who are descendants of West African Fula, Mende and Timne people who were trafficked from Guinea-Bissau and Sierra Leone to North Carolina and then to Florida where I was raised, born and raised, um, and also who are descendants of Latinx and European immigrants from present day Spain, Portugal, Great Britain, Scandinavia, and indigenous Creek and Seminole Americans um, with whom they and their progeny procreated. Um, because I embrace two spirit and gender queer identities that emanate from these African indigenous ancestries. I also choose the pronoun we rather than they in addition to he. And I am speaking to you from Birmingham, Alabama, which is the home of originally the Muskegee Creek, Porch Creek, Choctaw, Sioux, and other people. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll do a brief bio, and after I do each person's bio, I'll let them go directly into reading their poem. So first we have Khadija Queen. Khadija is the author of five books of poetry and hybrid prose. Most recently, I'm So Fine, a list of famous men and what I had on Yes, Yes Books 2017. Her verse play, Non Sequitur, Litmus Press 2015, won the Leslie Scalapino Award for Innovative Women's Performance Writing. The prize included a full stage production of the play at Theater Lab NYC by Fiona Templeton's The Relationship Theater Company. Individual poems and prose appear in Fence, Tin House, BuzzFeed, Gulf Coast, The Offing, Jubilat, Memoir, Best American Non-Required Reading, Diagram, The Force of What's Possible, and Widely Elsewhere. She serves as core faculty in poetry and playwriting for the low residency Mile High MFA in Creative Writing at Regis University 
and is visiting scholar in creative writing at University of Colorado Boulder. Thank you so much. Khadija, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, the bio is a little old. I am. Uh, I have another book that came out in 2020 from Tin House, and um, I now am an associate professor of creative writing at Virginia Tech. I'm going to read a new poem that has not been published um, that I was feeling some type of way about sharing, but I think it's important because um, it's something that I'm dealing with, and I think that. Uh, disclosure is an issue I would love to talk about in this panel. This is late diagnosis starting with a tweet. And the tweet is mine. Chateau Cadebon, France, 2021. Trauma and astrology don't explain everything, but I've got PTSD and ADHD. And on a 13th Friday in June, halfway through the 70s, third planet in retrograde, I guess I was born to learn in reverse. A calendared planetary curse to pay the wrong kind of attention. A virtuoso of distraction, extrasensory, too human, chaos more glitter than concrete, more confetti than anything solid or obedient to shape. Where do thoughts fly? Associative leaps when I knew what to call them felt like home like wings. It makes sense to live in the air, to refuse to live a life of almosts, but keep satisfaction impossible. My brightest failures, the slow sips of wine not yet aged to peak. Open another, try again. The bells in Bordeaux ring at 1904, a full minute the Wednesday after I've learned appellations, classifications, varietals, to smell and check color and swirl before I sip through my teeth. I dive into limestone and clay at Santa Million, facts of corporate takeovers of designations in ancient, once familyed hills, December vines bare against late morning fog that burns away to slate blue by noon. I know the difference between ease and complexity means knowing their concomitants. Rejection, sensitivity, and hyperfocus could blend into the wine kind of difficult magic. I savor a 2015 Grand Cru Classé and later try the year's second as unfortunate detour. The word disorder draws negative attention, but deficit means less lack than letting life hollow you out because someone else or a whole culture said to, said try harder, said not enough or too much. I could die too early, statistics say, from the wreckage lack of care could make of any mind. I climb cobblestone street heights where our guide tells us shit first rolled downhill. Now it's on my winter boots, an ancient limning I'll bring home as if I need more. He says Girondin, and I think of Girona, another avenue I'll familiar web myself into. Certain brains wander limbic, led by feeling, flight, light, surrender to love, curiosity or nothing but speed, pleasure, Formula One and richer, bolder, older reds I adore for a reason. I can't always follow instructions, but know to rectify mistakes. I believe it's less forgiveness than allowance, less madness and more the damage of false assumptions, less quirk and more dopaminic need and neurological pattern in infinite exploding pieces. And I'm explaining again. I might or might not learn when to quit and how according to taste and circumstance holding close what took time and art and an earth of chance to make. Thank you so much, Khadija. I'm sending a million virtual snaps, although on mute from my location to you and back. I'd like to introduce our next poet, Raymond Antrobus. Raymond was born in London to an English mother and a Jamaican father. He is a Kavi Kanam fellow and the author most recently of The Perseverance 
10 in the margins UK, 10 house US, 2018, and all the names given, Picador, 10 house, 2021, as well as a children's picture book that my children love, Ken Bearski, Walker Books, 2021, Candlewick Press, 2020. He is the 2019 recipient of the Ted Hughes Award, as well as the Sunday Times University of Warwick Young Writer of the Year Award. And he became the first poet to be awarded the Rathbone Folio Prize. The Perseverance was shortlisted for the Griffin Poetry Prize and the Ford Prize. He divides his time between London and New Orleans and is an advocate for several uppercase deaf, lowercase deaf charities, including Deaf Kids International and National Deaf Children's Society. The floor is yours, Raymond. Thank you. It's an honor to be here and to be sharing space uh, with all of these poets um, and yourselves. Um, I'm going to read a poem um, which uh, which actually began as a, as a commission. Um, I was asked to respond to the um, Human Rights uh, Declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and I had to pick one of the articles. And the week that I was asked to do this, um, a friend of mine, um, took his own life and I couldn't help but uh, think of him when I read the, this article, which is article five. And it says, quote, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Um, and um, so this poem honors um, a friend of mine um, I went to school with, uh, I went to a deaf school in London um, and his name is Tyrone. Um, and hopefully uh, the poem explains, uh, I suppose, the complication of a situation like his. For Tyrone Givens. The paper said, putting him in jail without his hearing aids was like putting him in a hole in the ground. There are no hymns for deaf boys, but who can tell we're deaf without speaking to us? Tyrone's name was misspelled in the HMP Pentonville prison system. Once I was handcuffed, shoved into a police van. I didn't hear the officer say why. I was saved by my friend's mother who threw herself in the road and refused to let the van drive away. Who could have saved Tyrone? James Baldwin attempted suicide after each of his loves jumped from bridges or overdosed. He killed his characters, made them kill themselves. Rufus, Richard, black men who couldn't live like this. Tyrone, I won writing awards bought new hearing aids and heard my name through the walls. I bought a signed Baldwin book. The man who sold it to me didn't know you, me or Baldwin. I feel I rescued it. I feel failed. Tyrone, the last time I saw you alive, I dropped my pen on the staircase. Didn't hear it fall, but you saw and ran down to get it handed it to me before disappearing, said, you might need this. Thank you so much, Raymond. Appreciate it, felt that. I'd like to introduce our third reader, L. Lamar Wilson. L. Lamar Wilson is the author of Sac Religion, Carolina Wren Press, 2013, a Tom Gunn Award finalist, co-author of Prime, Poetry and Conversation, Sibling Rivalry Press 2014, an associate producer of The Changing Same, POV Shorts 2019, which streamed at American Documentary and aired on PBS. Recent poems and essays have appeared in Callaloo, Poetry, Poem A Day, The New York Times, Interim, Tri-Quarterly, NPR, Oxford American, The Root, South, and The Washington Post.
Wilson, who spent nearly two decades in the nation's top newsrooms, including the Times and the Post, has received fellowships from Kave Kahnem, Ragdale, and Hearst and Wright Foundations, is an Afro-Latian poet, and teaches creative writing, African-American poetics, and film studies at Florida State University and the Mississippi University for Women. The floor is yours, El Lamar. Thank you, Salim. Wow, I am so honored to be, I'm just blown away by the poems that we've just heard. Um, I'm so honored to be among you. Um, I, it would only be fitting that I would read a poem that Khadija made happen in the world. Um, it, it emerged from me at a time where I was struggling to write and I was traveling the country, this is before the pandemic, trying to be free anywhere I could feel free because I felt so constrained. So thank you, Khadija, for this poem. Digging. Plant some shit, the gangster gardener's broken sink orders. Cordoned outside this fence, I cannot tell if a daffodil or spent honeycomb glares back, but surely it's gone and long forgotten to every eye but mine. Defiant, I nab a two green lime from the sidewalk, hide my bulbous skull behind a fiery frond withering in the middle of the block. Cast away too, I lie again, fain I can bring a dying thing back Keep digging and hoping I'll plumb the sophic root here in South Central LA. Every day we scale this barrier reef of chained links and lap the daisies I imagine doing backstrokes in what was once a pool. Bring compost and water, keep digging and hoping to play God. Call back from certain extinction, some living thing we assume we'll always have to waste because you said we must. Here I stand, my one good hand holding all I can salvage, believing I'll be born again in another Black man's big, warm hands. I want to be your Daisy May, gangsta boo. Grow a baby bird or three inside, sugar plum. A honey creeper or giant mountain lobelia, some coral, any doomed thing you want. Thank you so much, Elamar. The uh, the heart of mine is is completely swole um, from all of the love uh, from from these three poets. Um, right now, we're going to bring everybody back into our virtual circle and uh, have a, have a little bit of a, a conversation. All right, there we are. Thank you so much, everyone. So I want to start off uh, with a quote um, by Khadija Queen. And uh, the quote goes as follows. When one has to live in a body and a place where it is not loved, a certain fearlessness has to exist for the sake of going beyond survival to enjoying life and achieving self-love. I felt threads of this in each of y'all's poetry that it wasn't just about surviving, uh, but about thriving. And I'd be curious if we could uh, talk a little bit about that, um, that idea uh, as you see it either in your life and or in your poetry. I don't even remember when I said that or how, in what context. <laughs> I just be saying stuff. But I was definitely thinking that when I was listening to uh, the other two poems, like the continuous sort of insistence that certain bodies be excluded from some spaces, from public space, and not just in word, but in violent action. And what it is like to like, try to be bold in a space that demands your trepidation um to try to be your fullest self in spaces that are not designed to accept you or embrace you uh, it, it takes a certain kind of grit to do that i think and that's not something that we tend to um a characteristic we tend to 
ascribe to vulnerable people because we think of vulnerability as weakness. We don't think of it as strength. Um, we think of strength as, you know, whatever ridiculous uh, stuff we see on TV and, and those movie posters and whatnot. Um, so I think it's to our detriment that th that is the habit and uh, we need to just step back from what we're told and really just like open up and see what's actually happening. I mean, all I can say in addition to that is, you know, in the, in the midst of the pandemic, March 2020, right after my birthday, I decided that I was going to go home um, to a place where I never felt everything that I feel outside of it, which is exposed and, um, you know, unsafe and, uh, un and unloved. I was very blessed to grow up in a family that really loved me unconditionally, all of me, you know, uh, one-armed, uh, 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 what I call them, uh, you know, jumping jack, uh, two square jumping, you know, want to run around naked, want to run around with my sister's shoes on, whatever. Like they just, they just loved me, you know? And so, um, but I wasn't ready for a world that, that wasn't, they didn't tell me that the world wasn't going to love me like that. Um, that, that was the part that was hard. And that's the part that we wrestle with today. And my parents are in their late seventies and I live in a house next to them that we thankfully by grace were able to rebuild after a ter ter terrible hurricane that tore, tore it apart. So and before I even knew I was gonna move back, but I asked them all the time, why didn't you tell me how mean the world is to black folks, you know, like, or to queer folks or to disabled folks? Like, why didn't you, why did, and they, you know, they, they, their answer is, well, we just wanted you to be free. We didn't want you to be afraid. And so I grew up a free black child um, and I did not know, um, even at school, like people were afraid of my dad. I grew up in a small town. So people didn't, people didn't fuck with me, you know, cause they, they didn't want to mess with my dad who had like gone to the school and almost beaten up a man for saying something to my older sister. So I got the benefit of, you know, being the la youngest child in a family that was sort of like, these are the black folks who live out in the country, who have their own house and their own land. Don't fuck with these people. Don't mess with them. You know, th there's a history there. And so I wasn't ready for a world that that hates everything that I am, you know. Um, but thank God they gave me the the foundation to on which to build and and to 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 manage um, and to also say I need help, you know, beyond these people, right? To say I need support. Um, beyond this this set of family, like to get therapists and medical, you know, experts and people who can help me with things that they can't fix. Because I think we were raised to think our family was this safe place. Anything you need, just come together and we can make it happen. I was the child who ventured out into this big old world and and had to learn how to fend for myself out here. Yeah, that. I resonate with all of those experiences. I suppose I want to think about um, hmm, someone who made like the, the, some of the first people who really showed an understanding for me. Uh, that was um, holistic and. Um, sincere and genuine in the sense that there was like an understanding of how i suppose harsh the world is on one hand and how it, how many people out there need care and that was like uh, i suppose at school i had a couple of teachers there were teachers for the deaf um miss walker um and miss willis i think were the two yeah i'd say that they were two two teachers who really kind of took me under their wing. Um, I, I used to steal um, exercise books from my English teacher's cupboards. And um, I, was, I did that for a while until I got caught um, by one of the teachers, Miss Willis. And then when she saw that I was stealing the exercise books so that I could, I could write poetry and lines in them and stories and stuff, she said, okay, don't steal them anymore. I will, I will give them to you and kind of the act of being given these books and uh, 
kind of not having to hide or do something that provoked, I think, like some shame and privacy as well. I could actually like, kind of write in the open and share something I was writing um, with, a, with a teacher and a teacher of the deaf who also understood, I suppose, that kind of parallel between a deaf world, a hearing world. Because um, um, at home, I think, similar to Lamar, like my dad had a, you know, he was like practicing Rastafarianism. I think I was instilled with a, a very strong sense of black pride and, and, and blackness, uh, which, which was, I think, un, unusual. I didn't realize how unusual that was actually until I got out into the wider world. Um, and then there was still a kind of figuring out of like, you know, like my dad being like almost like his presence being almost overwhelmingly black to some people because he's like dreadlock. Jamaican Rasta man and you know that kind of stuff and, and people see something very different when they look at me as his son so there was a lot of kind of adjustments that I had to do where the, you know <laughs> which, which was which was tricky um but I, I, I suppose there's something in those um confusions and uh you know I'm, I'm kind of grateful for a lot of those that that journey um, if that makes sense. Thanks so much. Um, I wanted to bring up a couple of things from each of your, your readings that I'm sure uh, everybody in our, in our virtual audience is probably still hopefully sitting with and getting ready to hit rewind. Um, so there are a couple of themes that came up that, that, are, that I really wanted to, to you know, hear y'all reflect on. Um, Raymond, in, in your poem uh, for Tyrone Gibbons, you had a line of, but who can tell we're deaf without speaking to us? Right? And it brought to mind visibility and invisibility and erasure. And I'm kind of wondering if folks could uh, reflect on any, any or all of those three and how they might connect for you in your life and or work. Well, I guess I could say around disability, especially if you don't look disabled, um, people treat you in a different way. And if you try to ask for accommodation, it's a, I don't know, it, it's just like, nobody wants to talk about it. They want you to keep masking it. They don't really want to know about your problems and your issues, uh, not realizing that uh, it's not something you have a choice about and that it's causing harm, but it's instead you're expected to harm yourself in order to make them feel comfortable. And to me, that's a lot of like where um, blackness and disability intersect and also gender. Um, I can give an example of just being out with someone who wanted to walk really far and I can't do that. I also have like a lot of other stuff. I have spine issues and fibromyalgia and like a bunch of other stuff. So I can't like walk long distances. And I even used a cane in some places. And uh, I remember going to the grocery store in the, in um, the, you know, the motorized cart because I couldn't walk at the time. And people just presuming that they can ask you what happened because you don't look disabled. What does that mean? Like people thinking that your body is something that belongs to them, or what has happened to you, or your story belongs to them, that they have the right to ask that anything of you, whether that's um, the sublimation of your disability or the story of it. So I think that's uh, one of the big issues um, that we need to correct in our culture. I don't know if I answered the question, I went on a whole nother tangent, but. It's a conversation, not an interview, so yeah. Well, I mean, just piggybacking off of that, um, you know, in Sacrilegion, I, I have this poem that I thought was going to be the last poem I write about, you know, living with Herb's palsy. And the title of it is, What Did You Do to Yourself? Because that's the question that, you know, I would ask, get asked all the time, you know, like, how did you break your arm? What did you do to yourself? Um, and that's just the thing that they can see, you know? So, th so that's the thing that's so powerful about it is that, you know, some of us have these valences, multivalences of difference, of disability. Um, 
And for, as someone who has one that is visible, it is that is the thing that I feel called out all the time in having to explain what did I do? Um, how did this happen? And um, and so it does, um, but that see, that didn't happen at home, right? Because I didn't have to explain that. So as soon as I started school, um, they would say, oh, well, you can't play basketball. You know, you can't do that. And then my dad would show up and all of a sudden I could play basketball, <laughs> you know, like, uh, cause he, it was just like, he was just there. My dad is like that. He's not, he's 5'11". He doesn't have locks or whatever. He's just like, he's a perfectly coiffed. He actually, you know, Salim, you know, has, he has a, a, a beard much like that he did when I was younger. Um, and so, you know, um, I just had this big protector, which was my dad and my big brother, who was like the star of the, uh, at, in the little town that I was from. But so, but when I'm at, you know, when I'm at the grocery store and someone walks up to me and thinks they're trying to help, like, oh, do you need, do you need me to pick that up for you? And I'm like, first of all, who are you? <laughs> Second of all, like, what? <laughs> and like, I didn't ask for your, you know, help. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think I deal with the opposite, which is the hyper visible. And then also I get the, what are you? Because as I read, as I said in the, in the, you know, description, I don't look black enough. I don't look, what am I? Like, I, the, people just can't read any of the, the things, you know. Um, and even on some jobs that I've been on, um, you know, when I was mistaken um, as quote unquote one of them, I heard some really problematic jokes that, you know, my colleagues um, would say about queer people because I didn't present to them as queer at first you know, at work or uh, that, as they, that they would say about um, Latinx people, because I guess they thought, you know, if I'm black, then I really don't care. You know, just the ways in which our identities get refracted in the, you know, eye, eye lines of the oppressors <laughs> that are among us is so um, absolutely maddening if you, if you allow it to be, you know? And I say maddening in the most, in the purest sense, you know, um, it, it can really both trigger and empower you to, you know, it can galvanize you in a way that um, that it has for me in the last five or six years, building community with people like Khadija who say, you're not alone, you know, write that thing down. Um, however you see the world is just fine. You know, I could get emotional because, um, you know, finding people who actually see you uh, outside of the people who love you, you know, your original family has been the hardest, hardest thing for me um, to do. Can I piggyback off that for a second, Elmar? Um, and it's something, Raymond, that I feel like, especially in your children's book, um, uh, Kimberski has uh, really become a topic. I have seven, seven year old twins. Um, it's a miracle you can't hear them. Oh, my wife took them. So they're not. Okay. Um, and uh, it's something that I feel like comes up in the in that in the book as far as the visit when you have a, a disability that becomes visible at times mm -hmm. and something I think a lot about if my cochlear is on then I'm immediately perceived a certain way sometimes I'll literally do it as a joke I'll do a zoom call like this and I'll be like ah, you know and they're like oh I'm sorry let me turn on the closed captions oh my god what do you, what do you need the accessibility statement you know we're woke and I'm just like yo I'm just let me read the text at the bottom you know but I'm but I'm curious Ray because it's something I feel like has come up in some of your work is kind of when a disability becomes visible and then if and how it's, I don't want to say turned off, but turned off. Yeah, wow. There's a lot there. I mean, I even just want to acknowledge like uh, the incredible answers. Um, having just heard them, I, yeah, like emotional answers as well, um, which I think it speaks to the space we're in. You know, I think we're in a space where we're able to kind of form uh the kind of family here so i'm grateful for that um in terms of like yeah it's funny i was thinking about like the performance of disability or performance of any kind of identity really and i and i was thinking about different times in my life when i think i have consciously constructed um i put to you know to put on display uh a part of my identity um and like, as I've got, like when I was younger, when I started wearing hearing aids, I was, given, I, I was diagnosed late um, 
you know, I was already around seven, six, seven years old when I was diagnosed as deaf, even though I was born with it. Uh, so I really resonated with what Khadija's poem about a kind of a, a late diagnosis um, and thinking about how language acquisition, you know, is within, you know, the age of your children, Celine. It's now, isn't it? It's that seven years of life um, when we're soaking up language and what language is. Um, and throughout that whole time, um, I was, uh, first I was diagnosed as a select mute, and then I was diagnosed as a dyslexic with learning difficulties. And then I was diagnosed with deafness with, with that. And then there came this kind of intervention and this kind of thing. Um, um, and I'm actually extremely privileged. The kind of intervention I got was one which isn't actually available now because there was better funding um, for special educational needs in the UK um, in the 90s than there is now, which is kind of crazy. Um, and there are all kinds of political, uh, economic reasons for that. Um, I'm just kind of like so overwhelmed with, with, with where I could go with this. But I guess I guess I was talking about like the, the performance um, of disability and an identity. And I remember um, when the, the day I won the Ted Hughes Award, I got this phone call from a BBC journalist. Um, and I had to have this phone call, like, you know, I've got Bluetooth hearing aids that connect with my phone, you know, so all of that kind of stuff. And so the journalist couldn't see me as they were talking. And the second question after, is this very an Antrobus? Yes, uh, congratulations on, winning, on um, winning the Ted Hughes Award. By the way, how did you pick up the phone? I thought you were meant to be deaf. I mean, there suddenly came this like, sudden like, oh, wow, like I have to, but I fell for it. Like I, perf I think I did start to perform for their expectations, someone else's expectations of what a deaf or hard of hearing person is. And suddenly I was like, oh, you know, I explained it. Um, but then I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to turn the volume up all the way for this guy. <laughs> you know, like I needed to, I needed to uh, oh, like have a few, like what to that again, like kind of things. I thought about it afterwards. I was like, I consciously constructed that. I didn't need to do that um <laughs> so there's like some like guilt in that but i i um you know all of our all of our identities are kind of on a continuum and we're, and we're journeying through with them um and you know it's not it's not a static thing it's not one thing um and so going back to what you were saying about ken bear's ski and so the significance of that book is that you can see visibly the hearing aids of the bear and they're bright blue um and at the top it says Kambeski. The um, the colours of the book is intentionally very bright uh, and uh, with a kind of pun, kind of clever kind of thing, and they're a, a, a visually loud, um, colourfully loud book. Um, and and so the discussion that's come up around that has been also interesting and empowering, I think, um, and seemingly necessary i know i'm rambling on now um i hope some of that made sense totally, yeah. totally made sense from sense for me yeah yeah um can, can i shift to to another uh spot so um khadija uh thank you for your poem as usual i have to make a list to go to the dictionary and up my vocab so i think there's like eight that i that i need to be like yeah i totally know what that means and um no actually i don't i gotta figure out my concomitance if i'm concomitantly concomitant um so uh i love one of the stanzas when you say the word disorder draws negative attention but deficit means less lack than letting life hollow you out because someone else or a whole culture said so. Um, I literally was in a conversation earlier this week um, with another um, disabled poet and we were talking to a group of non-disabled poets and she said, you know, it, it was a, a training sort of conversation. She said to the folks, y'all should never use the word disorder. Um, disorder can never be a positive word. You just, you, it's already on your web, like you eradicate it from your website and whatnot. 
and, and I felt myself like triggered for a moment because I was like, you know, well, I, I've gone through different iterations personally and on paper of whether I want to say hearing impaired, whether I want to say single-sided deafness, whether I want to say vestibular disorder, or whether I simply want to say Ramsey Hunt syndrome, right? And I'm just curious to just sort of put that out. I don't want to like make the question too pointed, but just kind of it gets into language and description and how have folks navigated that, um, especially as Raymond said, it's not necessarily a linear thing. So I'm curious how, how folks have navigated that presentation. Yeah, I think as poets, we want to get into the language and we want to talk about legibility and who gets to legible to whom and how much do we have to explain and do you have a right to an explanation? And um, part of it is like, a whole other job on top of what you live in your life and the difficulties that society places in front of you as a disabled person, as a black person. Um, do you want to add that extra labor? Is it worth it? If you explain, are they even gonna change their behavior or is it just a curiosity, uh, something they're gonna leap off of and act even more ignorant? So I think I tend to not want to explain unless the desire to know is actually earnest. And in casual conversation, you can't really tell. Um, although at sometimes you can't escape those conversations and it makes a difference. Like, for example, being uh, in that motor race cart or in a wheelchair and, and someone harassing you to find out what happened to you, what's wrong with you and those questions and not taking no for an answer. And you're just kind of physically trapped in that space with them. So I think um, maybe what I wanna say around that is, um, I appreciate moments when I can let my defiance showcase itself. Uh, I appreciate moments when I can be prepared to uh, assert a certain um, level of humanity that is being denied to me in a moment. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes I'm taken off guard. Sometimes, you know, I just don't have the capacity and you know what Raymond was saying about the performance part was really resonating with me um and I think I forgot the train what like the baseline question that you asked because I yeah, it's not an interview I love it yes <laughs> yes well, I, was, well, you know, I think to add to that is that like I I think you know beyond the herbs palsy which I had a script you know that I was sent to school to, to disclose like you know the 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 uh the nerve was pinched in my spinal cord, blah, blah. You know, I had a script that I was taught to say um, for, for my for my Herb's palsy diagnosis. But as I went through subsequent things that I don't want to disclose, that are not visible, um, you know, uh, I, I'm in that weird interstitial space of deciding um, this is the first job at Florida State where I've actually come out as disabled, you know, fully and asked for accommodations. Um, um, that I need both for my neurodivergence and for um, uh, my physical, um, uh, one one of my physical uh, d disabilities. And so it is, um, it is an ongoing journey because we, I'm, you know, I'm in a, in a space where there's never been a person like me. And so I'm gonna be a problem for that system that has been working forever to not have to deal with people like me. I fa in fact, I think I got in the door because they didn't know <laughs> what they, you know, they didn't know all the gifts they were getting when they got me. Um, and so, um, and that's been my whole life. I, I've been in the closet, you know, about most of the things other than my physical, you know, disability, which wasn't to them a disability because I was a journalist for, I was a copy editor for 20 years and I ran desks, copy desks. And so like I was, I, I got elevated because of how fast I could edit copy and how I could manage people and how I could get things done on deadline. So I literally made my physical disability invisible by being, you know, excellent. Um, and I did not ask for any accommodations in, in my journalism career ever, other than for, you know, the white man to call me boy to stop, um, you know, or well, the person who made the joke about people who are living with HIV to stop, you know, um, or, you know, I could, you know, journalists, I think, to get through covering things like Ukraine, 
they they can be pretty hard and and you know in in their in their way of being in the world. That's the only way I can apologize for some of the things I've heard on the desk that I'm going to write my book like Khadijah and, and and write it all down and and out all these horrible things that they said. I'm working on that memoir right now. Um, um, uh, there's a reason that Jill, Jill Nelson called it volunteer slavery. You know working at the Washington Post, uh, where I also work. And so, um, you know, I just, I think that that is, that is my response to the situation is that like, I'm still coming out. I mean, uh, the poem that I'm going to read at the end is a kind of coming out uh, about some things because I feel safe in the space to do so because I feel loved and held. And I think Kaveh Kana was a place that, that, that this sort of journey began outside of my home. It was the first time that I found people who were smarter than me, more beautiful than me, who saw that I was also smart and beautiful enough to be among them and that I could be vulnerable and, and not on and not always say the right words and still be loved, that I could be sad sometimes and still be loved. I'm thinking of uh, Cam uh, Awkward Rich's poem, All My Friends Are Sad and Bright, you know? Um, it's one of my favorite poems, We Know the Story. We've seen the news, how our bodies hurt us sometimes so much. That's what it felt like, you know, being at Kaveh Kanum, that that was almost implicit and understood and okay. Thank you. Um, can I hop over to one more? Because I want to be mindful of our time. I wish that we actually had a full conference um, instead of an hour. Uh, we'll work on that. Um, in... Uh, Elamar, your poem, Digging, really got me thinking about eco-poetics and kind of the some of the intersections um, with disability uh, poetics. Um, something I think about a lot being a, a city mouse, I mean, a country mouse in the city, you know, so to speak. And um, the, the part that really sticks out is you have a line where you say, believing I'll be born again in another black man's big warm hands I want to be your Daisy May, Gangsta Boo. And so it made me think of something that I I, I wrote in a, a reflection once where I just briefly said that the spaces that have traditionally nurtured me as a writer, uh, I mentioned the Blue Ridge Mountains, Congaree Swamp, the Coeur d'Alene Mountains, and that those places are fraught with accessibility barriers um, as well as interpersonal dangers, right? The white separatist groups, um, but then I wrote, someday I have to return to these places, which made me think of Khadija's uh, remarks of a certain fearlessness has to exist um, because my young children too deserve to see these mountain sunsets, right? Um, so I, I just uh, wanted to hear anybody's uh, reflections because I feel like the natural world is, especially as black folk, there is often a complicated relationship with the land, but a relationship nonetheless. So I'd be really curious how disability informs how you think about your positioning within the natural world. I think I want to say quickly that it interferes with social connections. I lived in Colorado for eight years. A lot of people hike and ski and snowboard. I, I can't do that. I could sit in the lodge and sip some cocoa, but I'm not getting on your own skis and snowboards. I'm just not doing it. I'm already raggedy. Why am I going to even like pretend like that's something I would like to do? I'm not climbing your mountains. I'm tired. I need water. I need to sit down. So that interfered with a lot of social gatherings and connections with people. So I think that's probably the, the, the biggest cost for me. I can appreciate, I feel like there are ways to appreciate nature without putting your body in danger. Um, and I, I wish, it's my wish for us all that that could be respected and uh, that folks who can't access these kinds of spaces in the same ways uh, could, you know, be thought of when we're talking about outdoor spaces. Um, I had a teacher, an art teacher in Atlanta who used a wheelchair um, and she did a performance piece where she was trying to uh, show how inaccessible this new beltway that was being built was for wheelchair users. It was just like the sidewalk would stop and, they'd be and she'd be stuck, you know? So just even considering people who deal with mobility issues or sensory issues or, or whatever, just considering all the ways of being as we're constructing spaces in society and as we're thinking about access to natural spaces feels really important.
Yeah, I suppose um, one of the um, interesting, I suppose, kind of uh, entry points uh, in, in this and thinking about specifically my kind of deafness in the natural world and something that I've written quite a bit about and continue to think about. Um, so like, I don't hear any high pitch sounds about hearing aids and stuff. And so, for example, bird song was not part of my world at all until I was introduced to that through artificially, you know, through hearing aids. And then when I, you know, when I'm kind of spend a significant time with a lot of classic literature, especially English, a lot of classic English literature, the romantics loved birds and bird song and then how they talk about that and bring that in. Um, and then, you know, and, and I've written about this as well, about like, uh, when I'm in like holy spaces and cathedrals and stuff like that. And when you've got that really echoey kind of sound and that's meant to kind of project a kind of, um, otherworldliness. Um, but for me, it just like kind of muffles everything. It actually creates an inaccessible world, um, rather than an accessible world. And, um, so, I mean, one of the, the noisiest bird nature places that I've, I've lived so far in my life is, uh, is actually Oklahoma. I lived in Oklahoma for a year and that was like a fascinating experience because I lived like right next to this park and every day I'd go for this walk. Um, and I noticed you know, cause you get a lot of storms and you get a lot of strange, intense weather in Oklahoma. So you would, you would hear the birds leaving and then you would hear them come back. And that was like a new experience for me because I was always going for walks with my hearing aids in because as well, like I'm in a new environment. I felt like I needed to have some kind of spatial awareness. Um, cause I go for walks with my hearing aids off actually when I'm in spaces that I feel completely comfortable in and I don't, you know, and I want to kind of shut that out. I think about that, but like, I do think actually that the, um, I don't know, intersection or conflicts or, or uh, sometimes even a harmonizing, like there's an, always an interesting relationship, I think, uh, and something to be said. Of, um, and like what Khadija said earlier about like, as poets, we're looking for a language and, and we'd be looking to kind of uh, engage with, uh, with the language of, I don't know, of ourselves, of our bodies, but specifically our experiences, I suppose, and share them and put them out into the world and create a kind of conversation or an invitation um, into one's, I don't know, imagination as well as kind of lived life. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll end my splurge of thought there. No, I wish, I just wish there was more time. I'm so glad that this is the start of a conversation that will continue somewhere um, soon together, hopefully in person in a new, in a new time in a new world. But I, I just, because you asked about that poem, I, I disclosed earlier that, you know, I was struggling to write and Khadija sent me this invitation to, to send her a poem for consideration for publication in the New York Times. And I'm like, oh my God, I get published in the New York Times. I, I was, I had a really, I was struggling to write. And so I was out in South Central LA going to the gangs garden there's house because I kind of am in love with the man in my mind. And I was like, I just want to see the gangster gardener where his dogs were not having it. So like he has like serious big dogs and they were barking. And so all I could see was the sign plant some shit. And so, and I could peep in and see, you know, different things that were available there. Um, and I was in love with him because he reminded me of my dad. He reminded me of Mr. Mac and Miss Nellie and, you know, all the people that I grew up with in this community out in the country. And so as a person who grew up with a lot of quiet time to myself um, out in the country, uh, sitting under trees, reading and experiencing not just birdsong, but all the things, you know, um, I like my alone time. I like my quiet time. And so, um, but I, I have to have outside spaces to do it. And so when the pandemic hit, I literally got in my car that week and I packed up what I could in my car and I drove the eight to nine hours to come home, even before Wake Forest, where I was teaching at the time, shut down because I knew I can be alone, but not inside of a closed apartment 
that, like the one I was in. I needed space to run in um, because I live with the things you can't see are, you know, anxiety uh, things, related things without going into too much detail um, related to trauma uh, that has occurred in adulthood. And so I just knew I had to get out where I could run. I could be, I can be anywhere as long as I can get out and run. And thankfully I grew up in a free black space that's still free and black because most white people don't wanna be bothered with us out here in the country. <laughs> and it's been that way since 1870 something. And so, you know, whereas everybody was inside and we were inside separate in two separate houses, I was able to run, you know, um, uh, five miles and not leave my land. And so that kind of uh, uh, safety, um, that kind of peace. One of the last times I did a Zoom for Kaveh and Kanam, somebody looked at me and said, oh, you look sad. And I was like, no, I, this is what peace looks like for me. Like, this is this is what joy looks like for me. Because um, I like my alone space, but I need, I need space to wander around in that space alone. I can't be constrained in, a, in an apartment. Um, uh, and I don't have to talk to anyone else. <laughs> I just, but you know, but, but yeah, so that, that's the short answer about that poem, which is that for me, uh, I was seeking a connection to a black man who understood that about what it means to make in a space like South Central LA, which has a history in being much more rural and much more, you know, um, agrarian than is known, right? If we look That's back- That's the truth, I grew up there. Yeah. And I was always outside. Yeah. And so that that's not what we get in the, the movies of the 1990s and onward about LA. And so I wanted to sort of reclaim that history that I knew, which which he clearly knows and which you know, Khadijah. Thank you. Uh, I think what we'll do uh, to to hopefully not too awkwardly pivot, because I, you know, again, I think all of us are on the same page if we would we would want discussion to continue. Uh, is uh, maybe bless bless the audience with a few more words, so um, everyone can do a short uh, a short poem uh, to kind of close us out. If that sounds good to everybody, uh, we could just go in the same order uh, that we had before, which was uh, which was Khadija, uh, Raymond, and Elamar. This poem is from Anna Dime. It's called Something About the Way I Am Made Is Not Made. Something about the way I am made is not made to make sense. I stretch my insides across pages until my pain is upside down. Peonies and tulips bloom red and pink from my back, bent like washerwomen's knees, full on shadow. But I could have neon feathers if I wanted, faux apparatus of flight. I could have cultivated in error the bad luck of odd numbers. Spectators claim ancestral innocence as ever a suit two sizes too small for escape and inside the coveted dance I first look down at extraneous steps in shame. For all my notes and vices I still long to stop the false fight for my humanity allowed to share a history of anything but suffering. This poem is called Echo. Um, it's, it's, it's a this entirety is a five part poem, but I'm just going to read the first part. Um, each part stands on the page as a kind of pillow of language. Um, and I wrote this poem um, after being in Gaudi's cathedral and looking up into the space and, and, and listening to the sound of this space, um, which was designed for angels. Uh, you know, to, to, so you experience sound as angels would in this space. Um, and I didn't have that experience because um, uh, of. I suppose my hearing and hearing aids and stuff like that. So I just came out and mused this idea of um, who gets access to the divine. If the way that we access to the, the divine is through a kind of sense uh, like hearing, echo. My ear amps whistle as if singing to echo, goddess of noise. The babbled knot of tongues, of blaring birds, consonant crumbs, of dull doorbells, sounds swamped in my misty hearing aid tubes. Gaudi believed in holy sound, 
and built a cathedral to contain it, pulling hearing men from their knees as though deafness is a kind of atheism. Who would turn down God? Even though I have not heard the golden decibel of angels, I have been living in a noiseless palace with a doorbell is pulsating light, and I am able to answer. I love that poem so much. Thank you for reading it. I love that poem. Um, this is disclosure, disclosure, two words. In the States, you and I love I am a criminal, and by morgue, cell, or sanitarium, they will put me away. It's always my fault. After good night, John boy, I let myself loose, like mice scouring a soiled kitchen floor, blind but hungry beyond the good sense God gave us all to smell a trap. Loose booty, and you big dummy, and scuttle but to an other, other, a darker corridor where the last piece of Havarti and Dill was waiting in the form of a man's flesh, sculpted like a magnum chocolate bar I had to devour. Round and round we go. In the States, you and I live, his pretty teeth ensconced in goals, criminal and his free and nappy hair, his acipitral tongue keen to threadbare my issue of anal face, also criminally glory unbound. Where we stop, nobody knows. Round and round go, where we stop, nobody knows. I crawled atop his grotty bed, eyes blazing high on the hype of his profile pic. Let the heat rend his magnum sleeve and. Thank you so, so, so much, everyone. Just gonna wrap up. And again, please visit um, all of these authors, support, share, amplify, stay inspired, be inspired, and hopefully listen more deeply wherever you are. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you all so much. A pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. What a, what a pleasure. So Thank honest. you.